Chapters 8 and 9 The moment I opened my eyes, I found myself in a bright white room. It felt like I had been reborn. I, the new reborn Ryoko Odanashi, woke up with a renewed sense of vigor as I stretched my body out, getting out of bed. Turning my gaze to the window, the sun's light filled the white room with its brilliant light from between the curtains, signifying the morning's rays. It appears that I fell asleep at some point. Being forgetful, I couldn't even remember the time I fell asleep. Ah! At that moment, I felt light rush in from the back of my eyes. An image conceived itself within my head. Underground facility, preparatory department, Monokuma. A sudden flashback, definitely an unfamiliar experience. Could this be my memory? I immediately ran through my itching consciousness. It felt like I could remember something, but at the same time I couldn't remember it. It came off like a natural sensation, yet at the same time I was embraced with bewilderment. What is this? What happened to me? Frightened with puzzlement and unsettlement, I shakily looked around the room. Doing so, I found my backpack sitting by my pillow. I hurriedly rummaged through it, and as I thought, there it was. The Ryoko Odanashi Memory Notebook. First things first. I need to remember where I am. I paged through the notebook to see if I could recall anything about the room. Um, this is the neurology laboratory. Ah, oh, thank goodness. Upon remembering that, I let out a sigh of relief. Wait, but where's Matsuda? Right away, I looked around the room once more, but I couldn't catch sight of his appearance anywhere. Matsuda. As I looked down towards my notebook, I remembered something important. Speaking of him, I haven't received treatment from him in a while. Now I know why my head's been getting all funky lately. If that's so, I need to get treatment from Matsuda as soon as possible. The moment I was enveloped by that impatience, something interrupted. Russell, Russell. I heard a strange sound. It sounded like it was coming from under the bed I was sitting on. I ran through my itchy conscience once again. Someone's voice repeated itself in my head. Um, why are you under my bed? Mental concentration for facing irritation. Once I remembered that conversation, this time I energetically peeked under the bed. Matsuda? Then our eyes met. I met eyes with the individual lurking under the bed. But returning my gaze was an unfamiliar girl. Um, who are you? Without thinking, I brought out that question. The girl now on her back shot back with a curt response. Do you think you could move from there? You're in my way. Uh, sure. Puzzled, I stepped away as the girl immediately crawled out from under the bed. She got up with a short grunt and began brushing the dust off her body. Inadvertently, my eyes stopped at her hands. The black leather gloves that neatly wrapped around her skin were quite impressive. But, possibly finding my stare uncomfortable, she quickly moved her hands behind her, as if to hide them. Looks like the rumors were true. Huh? Without any preface whatsoever, she suddenly began speaking to me. W what do you mean by rumors? Memory impairment, right? I heard you're in treatment. Hearing that, once again my brain was assaulted by itchiness. Without thinking, I sat down onto my bed. The girl appeared to give me a dubious look. Trying to ignore the itchiness in my head, I asked her, Uh, are you someone I know? Kyoko Kirigiri of Class 78. The response was a name I've never heard of. Right away, I opened my notebook and searched for any kind of mention, but I couldn't find anything. So, she isn't someone I know? The details of your memory impairment were kept low-key in order to prevent your own confusion. That was your intention, wasn't it? Or possibly Yasuke Matsuda's intention as well. In face of her taking control of this interrogation, I was lost in bewilderment. H huh? W what are you talking about? I see. So you don't remember that either. Wait, you know Matsuda? Upon those words, she became quiet. She diverted her eyes as well only making her look more suspicious. Without thinking, I approached her. Hey, you know him, right? If you know him, then please tell me. 
Where's Matsuna? I desperately asked her. After all, he's all that's important to me. I want to know, and I have to know, as long as it's Matsuda. Unfortunately, I don't know either. Eh? Matsuda grew further away from my reach. Failing to hide my disappointment, my face fell into dismay. The girl absentmindedly gazed towards the window while murmuring. I'm searching for Yasuke Matsuda as well. There's something I need to confirm with him. Something you need to confirm with Matsuda? The moment I responded, she returned her gaze towards me. She examined me as if looking for something. I might as well confirm something with you as well. Eh? Earlier, you peeked under the bed while calling Yasuke Matsuda's name, right? Was that because you knew that was something he'd normally do? Huh? W what? The sudden interrogation flustered me, and the girl continued to corner me. You'd be better off answering honestly. Lying will only make this conversation more difficult. It's not like I need to lie about- Then you can answer honestly, right? I timidly gave in to her pushing words. Yeah, I knew. Matsuda said that when he gets annoyed, he has a habit of undergoing mental concentration under a bed and falling asleep. But what does that have to do with anything? Hmm. Mental concentration, eh? An eerie smile crept up Kitty Giddy's face. It seemed like she was making fun of Matsuda, so without thinking, I was about to... Well, it must have been a lie, though. Huh? Yasuke Matsuda must have had a precise goal in mind crawling under that bed, just like how I was earlier. While I was still talking to her, Kitty Giddy crouched down to the bed and slowly stepped towards me. She finally stopped right in front of me and spoke while looking downwards. Could you move? Huh? Oh, okay. Confused, I got off the bed, and the girl put her hands under the dormant bed sheets and threw them up in one motion. The bed sheets gently floated in the air. You can see it, right? Kitty Giddy pointed under the bed. I walked over to her side and squat down, peeking under the bed. The one portion of the floor under the bed seemed to be sticking out unnaturally. There seemed to be a 50 by 50 space that led into darkness. A hidden room. Not just a simple one, either. It's about the size of a storehouse. A storehouse? Probably to store a corpse. Huh? While I was completely taken aback, Kitty Giddy continued to speak in an indifferent manner. There is a corpse hidden under here. Actually, two corpses. They appear to be the two missing members of the committee board. W what are you saying? As blood rushed to my face, I unwittingly shouted out. Without looking towards me, she continued to speak with a cool face. It was a joke. J joke Corpses typically begin rotting within 5 degrees Celsius. If there were a corpse here, it would have already been thoroughly decayed. Hey, do you know what bodies actually go through when decaying? Sulfur-carrying proteins throughout your body begin decomposing, releasing hydrogen sulfide, creating a decaying odor strong enough that it can't be removed with just washing. And it doesn't just smell bad. The decaying gas increases pressure throughout the body, changing the muscles completely. Eyeballs would pop out from swelling like ping pong balls, the tongue and lips would enlarge, and even the ends of the arms and legs would bulge out. The skin would then turn black and become nearly unrecognizable from its living counterpart. There's no way something like that would be around here. Just hearing that caused something sour to rise up, and instinctively I covered my mouth. Uh, I see. It was just a joke. Although, I was completely joking. As if to further pursue me, she once again returned that stern gaze towards me. And here is a jersey as black as the interior, along with a pair of shoes of the same color. Most likely they were planned to be washed, but there are still some traces of blood remaining. A flat car easily capable of transporting a body is located here as well. S so what are you trying to say? What I'm saying is that Yasuke Matsuda was involved with the murder of the two missing committee board members. At that moment, a shiver strong enough to make my body jump assaulted me. My teeth shaking, I desperately shot back. W w what are you saying? There's no way Matsuda would murder someone! No one said anything about him killing anyone. 
All I'm saying is he was involved with the murder. Her thin, colored pupils appeared to shine from the sunlight momentarily. Although, what about the murder of the student council president? I doubt he was just simply involved with that. Huh? Last night, super high school level student council president Sosha Murasame's corpse was found, which was believed to be suicide. But without a doubt, that was definitely murder. I wasn't able to see the end of this conversation, but even so, I instinctively had a bad feeling about it. The rate of the thumps in my chest raised to alarming heights. My breathing became ragged and sweat began pouring all over my body, and the blood vessels in my forehead began to violently pulse. Most likely, Yasuke Matsuda killed Soshin Murasame. I could hear the sounds of the pillars supporting my stability crashing as they fell. An inconceivable mass of uneasiness developed inside me. The strings of thought telling me to argue back jumbled together into a mess, stopping me from forming them into words. Kitty Giddy continued to stare at me with those eyes, so calm and collected, almost to the point where it pissed me off. Those eyes had no emotion, they were purely observing me. Nothing makes sense anymore. My messed up head, my tangled up thoughts, the overwhelming uneasiness, and those cold, piercing eyes attacking me all at once as I sunk down into a bottomless swamp. While sinking, I desperately struggled and screamed out, This has nothing to do with me. I've had enough. I'll forget about this. If I just forget about it, everything will return to like it was before. This isn't an attempt to escape, rather, it's a battle. A battle to fight off anyone that isn't Matsuda out of my world. Nothing to do with me, nothing to do with me, nothing to do with me, nothing to do with me. Before long, in harmony with the explosive beating in my chest, my voice became a scream. Nothing to do with me, 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 nothing to do with me. As I continued to frantically shout out, the boiling heat from the bottom of my stomach bubbled up like magma. This has nothing to do with me! And it really exploded. At the same time as my exclamation, the door behind Kitty Giddy shattered. Small shards of glass and wood fluttered through the air, and the door as if made out of paper fell to the floor. The sound of destruction then finally reverberated around the laboratory like a storm. I couldn't believe it, but I did that. Me. While looking at the spectacle past Kitty Giddy's turned head, this is my true power? I, Ryoko Odanashi, felt this fearsome ability awaken inside me. When Kyoko Kirigiri stepped into the neurology laboratory, that girl was already lying down on the bed. She heard rumors about that girl. Supposedly, she suffered from memory impairment and had been undergoing treatment in this laboratory. Seems they were true. But enough of that. More importantly, Matsuda doesn't seem to be here. Well, not like I was expecting him to be. Having already anticipated that, she changed gears and began investigating the room. Due to Matsuda's absence, she was free to do as she pleased. With that, she faced the girl lying on the bed. I should probably be careful not to wake her up. She wanted to avoid any unnecessary annoyances. She then began to cautiously examine around the room. After getting a good look around the room, she then proceeded to walk next to the bed. As I thought, Something suspicious. That impression was not aimed towards the girl lying on the bed. Rather, it was towards the bed itself. If she was curious, the natural thing to do would be to investigate the bed. As if a matter of fact, she began searching around the bed. Then, looking at the floor hidden under the bed sheets, she found a storehouse. Kyoko, detecting the black jersey and shoes along with the simple pushcar casually tossed in there, soon developed a conclusion. Yasuke Matsuda was involved with the murders of the committee board members. The only ones who recognized this were Kyoko and her client, the president of the school grounds. Furthermore, with even the corpses disappearing and hardly any decisive evidence for this case, she had all the more reason to continue to repeat her straightforward investigation. And she found a clue in an unexpected location for that very case. She didn't think Yasuke Matsuda would have been involved in this, but if that was the case, he might know where the remaining two committee board members have gone off to. Ignoring Kyoko's warnings, 
The four committee board members who had hid their whereabouts have now all become missing. But it seems that finally those whereabouts can be revealed. Whether or not it would be too late was a different story, but that wasn't important. Whether or not they help her or become sacrifices didn't matter. Her role was to expose the hidden truth as a detective, and those were her true feelings. But who would have thought that those two cases were connected? The reason she came here wasn't even related to the committee board in the first place. She was here to investigate the case on the corpse of Soshin Murasame found in the teaching staff facility. According to the school doctor, it seems that the last person to meet with Murasame was Yasuke Matsuda. And not only that, after that meeting him, he somehow disappeared to somewhere, hiding his whereabouts. As Kyoko thought, if Murasame's death was due to murder, then Yasuke Matsuda was definitely suspicious. If that's the case, then why did he murder Soshin Murasame? In order to find that motive, Kyoko came to his main headquarters, this laboratory. But seeing that Yasuke Matsuda wasn't just involved with Murasame's case, but the committee boards as well, saying that he was the center of these two cases wouldn't be too far off the mark. To be involved with two cases at the same time like this, there is no way it couldn't be a coincidence. If so, then what is his goal? What does he know? What is he hiding? While she was going through her thoughts under the bed, unexpectedly, a sound could be heard from above the bed. It looked like the girl had woke up. If so, it might be a good idea to ask her a few things. Chances are, it would be pretty unlikely for someone undergoing Yasuke Matsuda's medical treatment to be just a bystander. It might end up forcing her to realize the painful reality, but for the sake of revealing the hidden truth, there was no other choice. Again, those were her true feelings. There wasn't much time left either. Kyoko was struck with impatience close to frustration. If she didn't hurry, it may become too late to find the clues she needed. Yasuke Matsuda may never come back. That was her intuition, but it wasn't just simply intuition. It was the intuition of the Kitty Giddy family's detectives. That intuition drew her forward. It drove her to find Matsuda's whereabouts as soon as possible. It wasn't like she was worried for his sake. It was only that she had to fulfill her duty as a detective to complete her accepted request. It was to ascertain the whereabouts of Izuru Kamakura. Why? Because she was a detective. So then. In order to fulfill her duty as a detective, she began her interrogation towards the girl. I might as well confirm something with you as well. With that starting statement, she then proceeded to question the girl on sensitive matters in order to corner her. Then, as she observed her response, she developed a conclusion. This girl doesn't know anything. The girl was falling into mass confusion, and her state showed that it wasn't an act. And from what I could see of her forgetfulness, there was no sign that she could have been an accomplice. In other words, any further conversation with her wouldn't reveal any more results. Rather than becoming discouraged, Kyoko thought what would be the best course of action, but before handling that, there was something else to deal with. This has nothing to do with me! The sudden shriek that seemed to pierce her eardrums. Then, at the same time, the sound of something breaking roared behind her. Instinctively turning around, the door's glass fragments scattered through the air. Then, in the center of all that, a man's appearance revealed itself. That man looked towards Kyoko, and a hideous, sinister smile crept up to his face, resembling a death god looking to cast an ill omen. <laughs>